Good afternoon. Uh, this is the special meeting of the Education and Neighborhoods Committee for uh, Wednesday, June 29th. It is now seven minutes after one. Uh, I'm Councilmember Paul Krikorian. I'm joined by the Honorable Councilmember Dennis Sign, and we are ready to begin with our one agenda item. And when we're done with that agenda item, if there's any uh, public comment, please fill out one of these cards, and uh, we'll take that at the conclusion of the end agenda item. And item number one, our communications from the Mayor and the City Ethics Commission relative to the per permanent appointment of Mr. Bangwan Kim as the General Manager of the Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. Mr. Kim, welcome. Thank you. Um, congratulations on your appointment by the Mayor, and I'd uh, like you to take whatever time you'd like to uh, review with us some of the uh, progress that the department has made in uh, recent times, an overview of some of the accomplishments that uh, you think are most noteworthy over the last year or so. Uh, and then uh, we'll ask if uh, we'll ask for any questions that Mr. Zine may have, or uh, and then we'll go to public comment, and that should be it. So um, why don't, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Fung Line Kim, General Manager of um, Department of Neighborhood Empowerment. Um, I'd like to highlight uh, over the past uh, year or so the department um, in the aftermath of uh, the mayor's proposal to reduce the department size and um, consolidate under uh, the community development department um, was, um, was probably a very critical time for the department and the neighborhood councils. We really had to respond to uh, the city's fiscal crisis and being reduced by staff, uh, uh, being reduced by 50% uh, of our budget size. With all of the work demands of supporting some 95 neighborhood councils um, was in, indeed a challenge. However, um, I would humbly submit that um, in these fiscal crises, a lot of people say having to do more with less and um, I would humbly submit that we actually were able to accomplish more with less. And um, I'd like to uh, review with you uh, for the public record some of the major accomplishments um, that the department um, was able to achieve over the past year or so and some of the remaining challenges that I see uh, going forward for the neighborhood council system. Um, the neighborhood council funding program um, has really been a headache for neighbor councils as well as city because of the way that it was poorly designed from its inception. However, um, as a remedial measure, um, what we did was we, we redesigned the workflow, the way demand warrants were coming into the department. We realigned staff responsibilities. And as a result, um, the number of complaints uh, coming to your offices as well as our department uh, significantly <coughs> declined. We were averaging an average turnaround time for demand warrants of some 12 days. Um, as you recall, we eliminated and closed 92 petty cash accounts. Um, once we revived the funding program and established some of the goals that I set out for the funding program, I hope to address the ongoing concern that neighbor councils are out of pocket for expenses and the city has to find a way to kind of um, make reimbursements um, a manageable uh, program without uh, increasing risk and liability to the city. We standardized the budget <coughs> templates and we're getting very close to uh, creating the beginning of an electronic platform where neighbor councils will be able to track their expenses on the city's website. I'm crossing my fingers um, that I, my, my IT person can do that before he transfers to the LAPD. We completed uh, some 65% of the controller's um, audit recommendations from January of 2010. And we are about to launch a neighbor council volunteer treasurer's resource group that can help address uh, the need uh, that many neighbor councils have in terms of inexperienced uh, bookkeepers who are assuming the treasurer's responsibilities. Most recently, we implemented the council directive which, impl uh, which eliminated the rollover policy. We manually reconciled 93 neighborhood council accounts. Um, 
Tinita Larios, who's the funding program manager, was literally a human computer as she tried to coordinate all of the, um, the neighbor council accounts so that we were sure that the remaining balances um, gelled with what they had on their records and so that we could submit accurate numbers to the controller for to meet uh, encumbrance deadlines. So um, we're able to encumber unpaid bills. The uh, number of demand warrants that came in as a result of the uh, suspension policy um, was great, was more than we ever experienced. And we were flooded with demand warrants and purchase card transactions. And so what we weren't able to pay this year, we were able to encumber and we'll be able to pay. Our goal is to pay them in the first quarter of next year. <clears throat> we're still reconciling the numbers and working with the CAO to um, finalize those numbers. But I would like to take a moment to thank the staff of the department who really pulled together. Um, you know, the lack of significant complaints as a result of this implementation of the roll rollover policy, I think is evidence of a staff job well done under a high pressure filled situation. It could have easily gone sideways, but thanks to staff who really pulled together and um, came through. Education and training is another major function of the department, and uh, the department conducts regular regional workshops um, in every region, every quarter. We most recently um, conducted a training in the Valley where uh, nearly 100 neighbor council board members came out. I sent an email to the neighbor councils who were less than 50% compliant with the uh, ethics uh, testing requirement, and that jumped. That significantly boosted attendance, and so, we were able to not only conduct the um, regional, the ethics training with the city attorney, but we also conducted a GM roundtable, which is a new addition to our regional workshops. So it's our department's effort to facilitate communications <coughs> between city leaders and neighborhood councils. And we had uh, Nazario Salcedo from Bureau of Street Services, as well as Department of Transportation to talk about what they do and what, how they can establish um, more close relationships with neighborhood councils. And I hope to invite more city departments to participate in those um, roundtables. We have a completely revamped website and uh, we are investing more resources into creating that as an educational resource for neighborhood councils. We have training videos and we plan on uh, producing more videos with uh, featuring a lot of neighborhood councils as the stars in terms of how do you conduct effective meetings, um, how do you address Brown Act issues, and a lot of very nuts and bolts issues that a lot of neighborhood council uh, boards are in need of. We average uh, about 5,000 hits monthly on our website, so we know that it's being used on a regular basis. We um, increased compliance with the ethics uh, testing requirement by 150% uh, when I came in. It was uh, something like 20%, and we're now over 55%. So that's a concerted effort that we've been making to work with neighborhood councils to make sure that they're complying with the law. Um, policies and systems is another major function of the department. Working in partnership with neighborhood council leaders and board of neighborhood commissioners, um, we tackled bylaw reform. So um, for those of you who are not familiar with the, the importance of bylaws, that's essentially the governing document for all the neighborhood councils. It's their constitution, more or less. What we found were 95 completely different sets of bylaws. They weren't even in the same order. Many of them had vague or uh, silent provisions, say, on board absences and removal. So uh, in times where there is some friction between various factions, we have to fall back on the bylaws. And we were stuck with many groups because the bylaws were unclear about how to navigate out of these situations. So we are very close to significantly improving all 95 neighborhood council bylaws. We established a best practices template. The commission mandated that the table of contents be uniform. And um, that will go a long way towards contributing to the stability of these organizations because the bylaws are critical when neighborhood councils uh, get in trouble and serves as a way for neighborhood councils to be transparent to the public. They're saying this is how we operate. These are the rules by which we govern ourselves and hold ourselves accountable to the public. We continue to support the uh, policy recommendations to the Board of Neighborhood Commissioners who has governance over policies uh, 
dictating dictated two neighborhood councils. And we certified four new neighborhood councils. So we're up to 95 now. Uh, most recently was North Hills East. Uh, good afternoon, Councilwoman Hun. Good afternoon. North Hollywood West. And just last, uh, within the last two weeks, we certified Westlake North and Westlake South neighborhood councils. Um, a community that is 95% re renter population, uh, high levels of low income residents, uh, very much needed a neighborhood council to represent the concerns of their constituencies. Um, we provide direct assistance to neighborhood council boards. We, you, when we had more staff, we used to send them out to board meetings. We're do, losing staff, we had to redesign our assistance model. So we set up a help desk. Neighbor councils can call a general line, 213-485-1360, where they will talk to a live person. They can also email us. And we have uh, staff dedicated to that, and they'll answer all the questions that neighborhood councils have. My hope is that um, we're entering all the responses into a database, and um, my hope is that we can create an online resource manual that will take care of a lot of the frequently asked questions that neighborhood council board members have about what they're supposed to do and a lot of the procedures that govern their uh, board meetings and activities. And. Um, the redeployment of field staff is only solely focused on the neighborhood councils that we sense are beginning to uh, struggle, um, where there are factional issues, uh, where they essentially get stuck. There's a, um, there's a provision that w the neighborhood councils have in terms of um, entering essentially probation uh, phase before decertification, so that if we feel that neighborhood councils are going astray in terms of their certification requirements, then we will go in. Sometimes we will conduct their meetings for them. But our goal is really to help them get up on their own feet. But there are some circumstances that require our direct intervention. We also provide administrative support to the 95 neighborhood councils. We approve all contracts and leases for neighborhood councils, so they need <coughs> office space. We also uh, administer some five vendor contracts that uh, where neighbor councils can provide, can access temporary uh, office and clerical and bookkeeping assistance and help. And um, we also update the neighbor council board member contact list, which is an important tool that uh, the city and the general public must rely on in terms of being able to access their neighbor council board members. Um, <clears throat> neighborhood council boards are making decisions about public funds. They're also making decisions that affect land use issues. The public has a right to know who they are and to be able to communicate with them directly. So that's an important tool, I think, for uh, transparency. We are about to launch a volunteer program. This is another um, extension of the department being cut by as much as we have, but I think also is in keeping in spirit with the neighborhood council movement where we're really promoting community leadership. And so it makes a lot of sense to engage with neighborhood council veterans who've kind of figured it out on their own how to run board meetings, how to engage the public, how to engage the city. And so we formed a volunteer task force and we're rolling out uh, in the next month or two a program where we uh, take applications, go through a vetting process, and we're working with the city attorney as well. And uh, my hope is that over time we can create hundreds of volunteers that can go out to neighborhood councils and provide Brown Act training, do mediation, um, help them with their bookkeeping. And our staff are playing more of an indirect role where we're coordinating these volunteers and making sure that uh, neighborhood councils <coughs> are supported in a way that uh, meets their needs but also reflects the current city's uh, fiscal crisis. Um, Neighbor council elections are still outstanding in terms of uh, the decision that uh, the elected leaders need to make. Um, Councilman Krikorian has led a series of meetings and public hearings and uh, we've staffed a neighbor council election task force where uh, we put together a series of viable options. I think neighbor council citywide recognize that there is a fiscal crisis. There is, the city doesn't have millions of dollars to pour into a citywide election. And so we are coming up with viable options that are both cost effective, but also assure that elections are held in an open, fair, and transparent manner. 
Um, going forward, <coughs> um, Councilman Kokorian, along with other council members, have introduced motions um, trying to address a lot of the systemic improvement needs of the neighborhood councils, including a regional governance and administration system, uh, funding program standardization, the need for a grievance system, and um, standardized education <coughs> and training. And uh, while it has caused some concerns among the neighborhood councils in terms of um, the city again, once again, imposing a top-down solution. Uh, what I suggest to them is that this is an opportunity for neighborhood councils to work in partnership with the department and city leaders to say, this is something that's going to add value to the system. It's not going to be something that increases bureaucracy, and it's not going to be something that significantly increases cost. So um, I think this is a great opportunity to create an infrastructure that both enhances neighborhood empowerment, but also does it in a cost-effective way. And um, as I say to neighborhood councils, this is really an opportunity to come up with some proposals that you think are going to work citywide. Um, I'd like to, um, in concluding remarks, thank uh, Councilman Krikorian for your leadership. It has been indeed a pleasure to work with you um, as chair of Education Neighborhoods Committee. and. Um, you know, the, the charter purpose for neighborhood councils is something that I continually remind neighborhood councils of, and uh, it's something that it seems to me that we really need to return to the basics uh, in this times of fiscal crisis that, you know, many neighborhood councils think their main job is to take care of streets or, you know, to repair trees, but the charter is very clear that your role is to promote more participation in city government and to make government more responsive to local needs. And that's clearly written in the charter section. Much has certainly changed over the last decade, and the future will bring more change and growth. It's a very dynamic system. Um, the lifeblood of neighborhood councils are people, and we need to continually be able to draw more people into the system. They're, the system is certainly working in terms of its charter purpose, but whether the current 1,800 elected board members generates into another five or 10 or 20,000 people who feel that they're somehow connected to city government through their neighborhood councils, I think within the next 10 years, I'm optimistic that we will certainly get there in terms of creating that opportunity. Um, the department must change and grow to adapt to those changing needs. We're not like street services or police department, you know, where our services are pretty much, our service delivery method remains more or less the same. We have to be able to change with the growing needs of people as they um, learn how to make the neighborhood council system more effective. So it's important for us to remain mission focused, but being able to adjust and change our programs and strategies, all within the context of an historic fiscal crisis. So those are the challenges that face us. Um, but most importantly, I've learned that it's so important to learn to listen to neighborhood councils um, and to hear from them what they need from the city as opposed to me as a general manager thinking that I have all the answers. Um, that's never worked. And um, so I've learned uh, the hard way in some instances. But um, I would like to conclude by offering some observations in terms of going forward for you as the committee and the city council. What I've heard are past problems with new general managers coming in and bringing a different interpretation of what the department's role is. So some um, that has caused neighborhood councils to then react to policies that oftentimes didn't make sense to them and uh, weren't really having them spend the time where they needed to be spending. I think it's important going forward to clarify the department's role and to adjust existing ordinances to focus and prioritize the department's work. There's much in the existing ordinances that reflect 10 years ago when the department was charged with certifying neighborhood councils and kind of startup mode, but we're in a different phase, so I think it's very important that we try to codify as much as possible so that regardless of which general manager is in my position, that the department's role pretty much remains steady so that neighborhood councils know that the services that they can expect from the city are more predictable. 
The motions that you have introduced, Councilman Concordian, do present an opportunity to engage with neighbor councils and citywide leaders to establish policies that meet the current and future growth needs of the neighbor council system. And, um, and it's an honor to be a part of this historic addition to city government and to serve the people of Los Angeles. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kim. Thank you for your service. Uh, this is, as you point out, I think a very transitional time for neighborhood empowerment, um, the adolescence of the neighborhood council movement, if you will. It's a time where um, the role of the department is going to have to continue to evolve um, in how to service the needs of the neighborhood councils now that they are so well established and broad based throughout the city. Um, so that you're leading that department at a time of great transition and then to have this fiscal crisis overlaid over it um, has presented challenges for this department that um, are fairly mind-boggling. I mean the very existence of, of the department was in danger uh, just a matter of a few months ago and uh, so it's been a it's been a real privilege for me to be able to work with you as we've gotten through those times uh, and I want to compliment you and, and your staff in weathering the storm and uh, doing the very best that you can under extraordinarily difficult circumstances to continue to serve the needs of, of our neighborhood councils and, and all of our residents and uh, happy to turn it over to Mr. Zein first for your questions and I do want to note as Mr. Kim did that we've been joined by Ms. Hahn. Welcome Ms. Hahn. The, um, issues regarding equipment and audits and making sure that what is purchased is accounted for. What do you plan to do about that? Um, as you know, the city's current policy is to, um, is to do an inventory count of all city property every two years. So that is coming up very soon. Um, and we're preparing to um, inform the neighborhood councils what we do is uh, abide by the current uh, city policy of tagging and identifying all of the equipment. Um, with the staff limitations that we have, um, what I plan to do is with the volunteer uh, volunteers that we're going to be signing up, that we'll assign some of them to go out to the neighbor councils where they report uh, a large number of or significant number of missing equipment that can't be traced. So um, we will work with the neighbor councils to go back and look at where uh, missing equipment might be. A lot of times when a new board comes in and an old board leaves, um, the transition hasn't been as smooth as it should have been in the past. So there is a case of missing equipment. And Councilman Zine, you brought up this issue last, uh, last time we did the inventory. So uh, one of the policy, one of the things that I'll be requiring of each board um, in terms of missing equipment is for them to document the efforts that they've made to locate missing equipment and to pass a board resolution saying that, that we've done the due diligence um, that's necessary to account for public property, but that in the end uh, we weren't able to find it and to document what those equipment items are. They need to make police reports on that. So if that equipment does turn up somewhere, a swap meet or whatever, Absolutely. they will trace it, back, trace it back. I know a lot of equipment over the years has disappeared. The issue on elections, every three to four years instead of every two years and not using the city clerk and another process on that, what do you think about elections? I think there's a lot of neighbor councils who are concerned about postponing elections for another two full years. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think there's an opportunity again to work with neighbor councils to create uh, a viable election or selection system. There's nothing that requires neighbor councils conduct a full-blown election, for example. There are current ordinances that allow neighbor councils to do their own selection process. It's more or less like a, a town hall caucus selection process. And in many ways reflects the grassroots nature of the neighbor council. So I would act, I think there's a lot of interest in promoting that as a viable option for getting seated, board members seated. What we don't want to do is go back to the beginning where neighbor councils were completely on their own doing uh, elections. That was what generated the need for a citywide policy. But I think this is a good opportunity to go back and say, okay, if neighbor councils, some neighbor councils might be willing to pay for their own elections if they want to have a full blown elections. But um, there's also great interest in this election process. So we would have to sit down with them and codify 
what that might look like. For the five newly certified neighborhood councils, for example, we were able to um, describe a public selection process in their bylaws. Most of those neighborhood councils conducted their selection process pretty much on their own with minimal staff support. So we think there's a lot of potential for promoting that. Um, my goal is to try to get neighborhood councils some options um, before the two-year time limit. But I would come back to the council with recommendations. And you mentioned a 12-day turnaround on money. What about demand warrants that are out there and the confusion and the restrictions on what you can and can't purchase? Well, the, um, the current uh, handbook that governs all the policies and procedures for the Neighbor Council funding program is on our website, and we conduct trainings with all the treasurers. In fact, we've trained uh, 60 treasurers over the past year. We have, we're averaging about a 40% turnover with Neighbor Council treasurers. That's one of the least interesting positions for Neighbor Councils to volunteer for because it's a lot of work, liability, and um, very little praise and thank you. So. Um, there is a human capacity issue that we have to deal with. But um, I'm hoping that, again, going back to this electronic platform, that if we could s develop a way for neighbor councils to submit demand warrants on an online system with scanned documents, um, with the controller's office has been working pretty closely with us. They understand that there has to be some streamlined way for neighbor councils to turn around. Um, we've been, we got the average turnaround time for demand warrants to 12 days. I'm hopeful that we can return to that once we get over these, um, the year-end closing activities. And then what about the issue of what they can and can't purchase? Um, that's strict, that's also uh, described in our treasurer's handbook. Okay. So that's clearly laid out in terms of what they're allowed and not allowed to purchase. You say there are now at 95 neighborhood councils, there's a budget of $94 million including four and a half for neighborhood councils. Is there a limit on how many neighborhood councils can be established by the charter or could we have 200 neighborhood councils and 200 neighborhood councils at $40,000 a piece is a considerable chunk of change. So is there a limit? Because you mentioned North and South, on West. West, West Lake, North and South, and as they keep dividing, where you had one and now you've got two and three and four right. in a community. I don't, I've got six in the district I represent. It seems they're all happy and there's no intention, to my understanding, to establish any more than six. Right. Some districts have a whole lot more than six. Um, do we have a, a cap on that or is it just unlimited? And because along with that goes the funding. Right. I think the cap is in terms of uh, rather than an ordinance, it's really uh, governed by geography. So uh, pretty much all of Los Angeles, with the exception of some areas, say Pacific Palisades or Brentwood, where the community says, we don't want a neighborhood council. We have, we'd rather have a community council. Uh, but they don't get funding. They do not get funding. Um, but I think we're pretty much, I mean, I couldn't see more than 100 at, you know, when all the city is covered geographically. There is an issue, however, with a disproportionate population size. The smallest neighborhood council is 8,000 population. The largest is 135,000. Mm -hmm. And, and they get towns. the same funding. Mm -hmm. And they, they get the funding. same funding. Mm -hmm. So there, is, there are some neighborhood councils dealing with um, that inequitable situation saying we've got to address it. It wasn't mm -hmm. really well thought out mm -hmm. when neighborhood councils were first certified. Mm -hmm. That may be something that we want to return to, but um, in well, the neighborhood. I'm in no hurry to get there right now. The neighborhood <laughs> comes up with that. They're the ones that come forward and say we want to organize and form this. Yes. So you probably get more participation by the smaller number than you do with the larger number. Yeah. I think it's fair to say that the less people that you have to work with, the easier it is to operate. But I've also seen small neighbor councils that have a lot of difficulty because of the personalities involved. Mm. So I don't know that there's an absolute rule mm. governed by size. Okay. Well, you've weathered the storm, shall we say. Thank you, mm -hmm. Councilman, for your support. You're welcome. Thank you. Ms. Hunt. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, you certainly have weathered the storm. It's you know, it's, yeah. <laughs> Plus, it's been frustrating, I think, for you to be on an interim basis for the last three years. A uh, year. Oh, just a year. Well, okay. Last year, he didn't have one. Oh, that's yeah. yeah, yeah. That's right. So you've 
yeah, it's been pretty unstable for you as well. Uh, although, and Paul's done a great job as chair of this committee. I started out uh, when I first got elected. We created this um, committee. Uh, Alex Padilla was the first one that actually created the Committee of Education and Neighborhoods. I was the first chair. The mother. Thank you. <laughs> uh, and and I like hearing you reiterate, you know, the mission. And that really was the goal in this in the city charter was trying to figure out how to get people more involved in uh, government and um, and their neighborhoods, which I see them getting more involved in their neighborhoods and maybe not so much government. I still feel like there's a disconnect between weighing in on, on the decisions we made. For instance, a great one is this decision right here. Where are the neighborhood councils? <laughs> Where are the community impact statements? Why isn't all 95 neighborhood councils have an opinion on the general manager that will lead the department that oversees their future, their funding, their 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 uh, uh, you know their elections. Their, I mean everything. It's it, it still to me is still a disconnect. Good point. Between the, what we do down here and how it impacts neighborhood councils, there ought to be an impact statement from every neighborhood council on what we're doing here today. Where are they? You're right. So uh, that still bothers me a little bit that that they're they're disconnected. But they'll be the first ones to get upset if things are, aren't going right. And yet they got to weigh in before. You know, we make these decisions. Nevertheless, you guys really pretty much brought up some of my concerns. One was um, the funding issues. Sounds like we're going to do a better job of uh, them being able to purchase what they need to purchase. Um, elections are issues that I hear from my neighborhood councils. I would say, you know, almost split between those who like doing their own elections and those who actually liked having the city clerk do it. Um, it it uh, went very smoothly for some of those that, that the city clerk ran. So I had a motion in that was going to try to get us to have a, a system where neighborhood councils could sort of opt out or determine what they want. I don't know where that is, but you might want to consider how we're going to do it moving forward. Sure. Um, and remember, the reason we went to the city clerk version was because this committee all we did was hear protests of badly run elections in the beginning. I mean, it was ours. That's when they came down here, right? They were so upset with their elections, how they were run, name calling, finger pointing. The grievances that came to this committee over elections was, which is why in, in the 910, uh, 912 commission, that was one of the issues. Right. And I was the one that pushed forward having the city clerk do it because I thought neighborhood councils want to get wanted to move on to bigger and better issues than their elections, mm -hmm. and they were obsessed with the elections and how badly they were run by the individual neighborhood council. So that's really why we went there. And then, and then of course, you know, the budget hit, and we found out how much money was costing, and then we heard more complaints about how the city clerk was running them. So that that's still an issue, but um, I, hopefully we can. We can we can figure that out. And um, oh, I know one of the things was I know a lot of the neighborhood councils in my district have tried to be very proactive um, to ensure and retain certain city services. Right, They're, they've been trying to partner with departments, help pay for things like tree trimming or or whatever. Always still seems to be a, a, a bit of a difficult process. But that's something I can see the general manager, you and your department working with other general managers right. saying look guys my we got neighborhood councils that want to help pay for tree trimming in there um how can we how, how can we make that happen funny that you should mention that okay because i um in my opening remarks I, um, I said that uh in our regional uh quarterly workshops that we hold right i've invited general managers to participate in a general manager roundtable and um, Bureau of Street Services, uh, General Manager Nazario Sacedo, mm -hmm. um, he jumped on the opportunity. 
and he came up with a pretty interesting idea that engaged a lot of neighborhood councils. What he was saying that he lacks the staff to go out and inventory where all right. the street and tree repair right. needs are. Right. And he threw it out there. He said, let's create right. volunteer public works teams. Right. So we're actually putting together a small right. tool to right. allow neighborhood councils to track what their repair right. needs are. So that's one right. example right. of how we are actually right. taking up your I think the, the only, um, and, and again, I love the way the neighborhood councils have really taken in, taken ownership of their neighborhoods and their communities. The only thing I'm a little concerned about is how many times you've mentioned today the added uh, responsibility for these volunteers, whether it be mentoring new people, training new people. Now they're surveying fallen trees. You know, these are volunteers uh, out there. We have the greatest volunteer force in our neighborhood councils of anything, but I'm concern that we're because of our budget constraints we're putting more and more responsibility on volunteers um, and this and your department is now beginning to take a back seat really to to some of these functions uh, that would be my only concern here today is listening how many times you've said we're moving more responsibility more burden more uh, on our neighborhood councils and and they're volunteers. Right. At the end of the day, they are volunteers. And many of them have jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the end of the day, they're just, you know, trying to make their neighborhood a little bit better. But right. I'm, I'm a little uncomfortable with uh, how, how much we're talking today about adding to their volunteerism. <laughs> that would be my only concern. Well, you know, in creating this volunteer program, we, are, um, we engaged with neighborhood councils themselves to tell us how much we can, we, can we expect. Yeah from uh, volunteers, and a lot of them are saying that uh, they want to use their experience that they've gained over their years with neighbor council boards to help new members uh, into the system. So I don't expect that we'll, uh, we'll be generating a whole lot of volunteer hours, but uh, my hope is that we would focus on quality. For example, one of the big priorities that neighborhood councils themselves identified is this mentoring role, this coaching yeah. role, okay. to sit in on neighborhood council board meetings and offer advice right. on a real-time basis. So I think that volunteer needs are going to be discrete as opposed to spread out. Okay. All right. Um, we're going to take public comment now and I do want to know let me just go back to add did you two oh, uh, uh, council members get letters from your neighborhood councils on well, this I was decision just, I was gonna say uh, there are three written comments okay. uh, that I'm gonna share with the okay. committee members that we received this from like shocking to me. Uh, uh, Lewis Wong I mean, uh, who right. is a former NC director um, Paul Hatfield of Neighborhood Council Valley Village and Lisa Sarkin of the Studio City Neighborhood Council. Uh, those are the written uh, comments that we have, which I'm going to share with oh, thank you. share with you, Ms. Hahn. And uh, we have Mr. Glenn Bailey uh, here to speak uh, on this item. So, Mr. Bailey, if you'd come on up. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Council Members. Um, Hi. One of the reasons that you maybe there isn't a lot of neighborhood council input for this happy. is that this was called as a special. Well, that, okay, that definitely <laughs> is one option, and, and oh, very likely a special, special meeting. meeting. Okay. The notice went out yesterday, oh, and okay. so there's you know there Duly wasn't. Duly noted. Duly noted. Okay. That's good. Um, but that's one reason that I did make an effort to come down here because I do have some thoughts that I wanted to share okay. and make sure you got them and didn't know that you actually would be seeing the written communications. Um, I've served on the Encino Neighborhood Council since before it was a neighborhood council. Cindy Mizikowski set up community councils in her district before the process for neighborhood councils. So I've seen um, the process, even though we weren't the first neighborhood council, in fact, we were maybe 25th or something, but we you know, were there seeing the whole process go on. And you mentioned a storm. I would say it was a perfect storm that Mr. Kim uh, inherited with the death of his predecessor, mm -hmm. the but the fiscal situation, the consolidation of the department mm -hmm. threats, um, and and the various the controllers audit, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And I think he has 
he has had a steady hand and a steady voice more than any other that I've seen. And I've seen a lot of general managers, not just at this department, but other departments. And this department, more than any other, requires the outreach with now 95 different entities with a disparate personalities within each of those throughout the city. I've been to meetings of the Valley Alliance Neighborhood Councils. Mr. Kim comes to those. Um, I can't speak for the other alliances in the harbor in East LA and West LA, um, but um, he has been to the Valley Alliance many times. He's been to the, on Saturdays, at the uh, Los Angeles Neighborhood Council Alliance and at the election task force meetings and other meetings that, that neighborhood council people come to. You don't see general managers doing that typically, but that's part of his job and he does it, and again, uh, he listens. You know, we may not always agree, but I think, I think a very important part of this job is listening to different opinions, different suggestions, and I think he has initiated in many ways many of, many of those suggestions in response to that. So um, my time is up, but you know, with 90, hurting not just 95 cats, but the, what, 1,800 board members, but I do want to just leave you with this. It's not just the board members that are volunteers. They also are engaging other people who don't want to serve on boards, but they want to contribute to the communities. So I don't know if you can see this photo of Porter Ranch um, with volunteers. This was a weed-filled area that volunteers, most of, I don't know how many were on many neighborhood council board members, but I know the leadership wasn't, where they cleaned it up. They were a couple hundred dollars from the neighborhood council, got a sign that wasn't there before, removed removed a dirty lot that is now planted with drought tolerant plants, but got water from a neighboring property, so the neighbor is paying for the water for this area. Is the neighbor aware of that? I know, I was gonna ask <laughs> yeah. that. Just wanna make sure. Yeah, <laughs> for the record. Water property. Okay. Yeah. But this is just one small example of how, at very minimal cost of using neighborhood council money, using volunteers, many of whom aren't board members, of engaging our communities to improve our city. And, and I think if we can expand that under Mr. Kim's leadership and the neighborhood councils, I think we'll be a better city. Thank you very much, Mr. Bailey, and thank you for your service as well. Um, with that, if there's no other comment, uh, I'd like to move that this committee recommend approval of Mr. Kim's appointment as permanent general manager. I approve. Ms. Hahn, so that uh, will be the unanimous recommendation of this committee. Mr. We'll Kim, thank council. you very much. Thank you. We'll just go to council. When do we go to council? With Paul? This? Next week? Yeah. Well, maybe the community can come down and make some comments. Um, and Mr. Bailey, if uh, you'd like, we I also have a card for general public comment. Is there something else that you wanted to add? I'll make it brief. Sure. Um, I mentioned at a neighborhood council last night, of which um, the, commission, the board of neighborhood commissioners present was present because it was his neighborhood council that your uh, four motions, which I think are, are a step forward, um, but I, I would just hope that we try to figure out a way that neighborhood council board members could engage in a meaningful way. I know they came out of a, pro a very public process with your town hall meetings, but there are thoughts and comments on these, and it would be nice if we could figure out a way, perhaps through the regional alliance um, mechanisms, where there's four or five, rather than not 95 meetings, but maybe four or five meetings, where we could ask each of the regional alliances to put these on the agenda and, and engage in a dialogue. Because it's difficult it, coming to this committee where you get one or two minutes to speak, engaging in the complexities of four different motions. And even Bonk, you know, they have their business as well. So thank you for introducing the motion, starting the dialogue going, but just we need to maybe figure out how we can, without, I know some of them were just report backs, but report backs can be important in what they were report back to. And so if we could work on how we can engage neighborhood councils one more time in that review and input and suggestions on those four motions, that would be great. Uh, thank you for that suggestion. Um, and we certainly have tried to do that from the beginning, and I'm, I'm happy to discuss the proposals with the alliances. Uh, I know Bonk is planning to agendize it if they haven't already uh, for consideration within Bonk. Um, and in the meantime, everybody, whether associated with neighborhood councils or not, can always provide as much comment as they'd like to it through uh, my policy blog as well, which has all of the motions and, and uh, uh, 
where we can get input that way too. So thank you for the comment, Mr. Bailey. Uh, and with that, if there's nothing further, we are adjourned. <laughs>